Good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Backrack, PFH Capital. Uh, for those of you who do know me, uh, sorry uh, <laughs> to start. Um, but, but you've probably figured out by now that I have a bit of an obsession with the Polish market. I've been, uh, you know, they got about 800 listed securities there, and I, uh, I think I've looked at pretty much all of them, um, some of them very cursory, some of them deeply in depth. Um, today, uh, one of my favorites, I, I mean, I'll be honest, they're my favorite now because they just came around, kept, came halfway around the world for me here. So, so yeah, number favorite, I've lost all objectivity on the name if I'm being honest, uh, is now here. Uh, they're Spirosoft uh, Outsource Software Development uh, Business, um, taking advantage of these amazing, amazing programmers in Poland and selling their services to uh, mostly overseas clients. Um, the, uh, you know, these guys are, um, they're true outsiders, and not in the sense that, like, they read a book, you know, you know 50 millionth person to read a book telling them how to be different. You know, they, they, they're just, I don't even know that you know who Thorndike is. It's, uh, they're just different to their core, and the, um, and the, uh, the results are just, they've been astounding. Um, so they've been a regular fixture since they were founded in 2016 on about, I think it was 200,000 British pounds. They're about a $100 million market cap today, which I think is way too cheap. Uh, they basically, uh, you know, they've been a fixture in the uh, top 1,000 growing companies, according to Financial Times in, in Europe now, for, for three, four, five years. Uh, they were actually number, the number one fastest growing tech company in 2021. They were fifth overall, uh, sadly, in 2022. Uh, they got leapfrogged in the fourth place by OnlyFans, but that's tough competition. So, they uh, these um, yeah the, the the results have been remarkable. Um, you know, if I go back and look at the last four years, uh, I think about uh, seven or eighty percent, I think compound and annual revenue growth rate. Um, but that's not really what impresses me. You can't distribute revenue. You can't you know reinvest revenue. You reinvest income, um, and, and so their growth has been profitable. They averaged ROE about 70%, 75% free cash flow conversion, uh, net cash all the way through, not doing wacky acquisitions left and right. A lot of growth is organic um, and a stable share count. And of course, since all these insiders own 85% of the company, um, of course, they would want the share, the share count to stay stable. Um, so I'm just so pleased that CEO Conrad uh, Weiska is here. Um, and I'm also pleased that two of his co-founders are here as well, uh, Andrew and uh, Wojtek way in the back. And um, I, I was going to say something clever to finish, but I talked to my wife this morning, and she said, hey, here's a novel idea. How about you just shut the hell off for once in your life and just bring the speaker up? So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So Conrad, thank you. welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you very much. Yeah, so you okay. go on off, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Tom, for this great introduction, and thank you very much, Andrew and Wojtek, for being here with me. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, after an introduction like this, I can only make things worse, okay? So apologies in advance. All right, so as, as Tom said, we are a software delivery company, but what does this actually mean, okay? Everybody does software now. Every business needs software. Every company does it. So do, what do we actually do? So I'd like to tell you very briefly how it is usually done, who our customers are and how we do it. So first of all, our customers are usually mid-sized to slightly larger enterprises, okay? And there are a lot of companies out there who chase logo companies, okay? And they say if it is not JP Morgan, if JP Morgan is not your customer, then you have no right to be in FinTech, okay, for example. But this is not our approach. Well, most of our customers are mid-sized to slightly larger enterprises, and this is good because we face very little competition there, okay? They are not from places like New York, not even Chicago. They are from more remote places where they really need access to first-class, world-class software development services, and this is what we provide. We face little competition there, and these customers tend to be extremely loyal, okay? So this allows us to grow really fast. Because we don't chase logo companies, we chase, I would say, sensible work, okay, and decent people who need it done. So this is first thing. And then when we go there, and they are happy to see us, okay, which is, may not always happen at JP Morgan, uh, then we simply tell them, listen, what do you need done? And they ask us, well, is, Bitcoin, uh, is blockchain good for me? How do I leverage AI? Uh, well, should I, should I be in the cloud? What can you offer me? So this is what we do. We start with technology consultancy, and we tell them how to digitally transform their businesses, and then we take it from there. 
Okay, so this is what we do in a nutshell. Start with consultancy, then software design, architecture, maintenance, and so on and so on. So that's all we do. Obviously, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. So as Tom mentioned, in 2021, we were the fastest growing technology company in Europe. And if Financial Times say so, then of course, nobody can doubt it. Okay, so obviously no questions asked. And well, the thing we do with our company, uh, well, if I may describe it like this, this is not actually a company. And I've been told investors are not going to love it. Okay, so again, apologies. We are a group of companies. So what we have created actually is a plug and play platform, okay, to which we connect new companies and new people who want to do something that we are not doing. And the goal is to provide complementary services to serve our customers and to end. Because them being mid-sized to slightly larger enterprises, they do not have really that many resources to juggle multiple suppliers. Okay? They would much more prefer to buy it from just one entity, and this is in most cases us. Okay? So what we do, we, well, we are a magnet for individuals mostly in their 40s, who have been around the block a couple of times, okay, in a good sense, and who know how to attract customers, who know how to attract talents to work for us, but may be missing several resources, like capital. They may not be familiar with marketing, HR, legal, and so on and so on. So what we offer them is back office services, including recruitment, including, including our sales network, and these people start companies with us, okay? With us as majority shareholder and them as minority shareholders. So, well, there are a lot of people out there who at some point in time want to run their own companies. So we offer them this possibility and we make it super safe for them because we obviously provide a lot of advice which they sometimes do not follow, but it is okay. But at least we'll not allow them to do something very stupid. Okay, and they can fall back on us when, well, when they need some more cash, for example, when they need uh, something done. We help them a lot, so this is how we grow. And this has allowed us to grow relatively fast, so this is quite close to exponential growth, I guess. And as Tom mentioned, uh, well, this tiny little thing on the left-hand side, it's actually 2016, okay? When, together with some of the gentlemen in this room, we decided that, well, our corporate life, uh, well, it's actually boring. It's not really fulfilling anymore. So we, sh well, we have every right. We deserve to run our own company. Okay. So the idea, as you term, as you mentioned, is quite simple. There is a huge demand, especially among mid-sized, slightly larger companies in the West, including the US, the UK, Germany, generally that area. And there is talent pool that is easily available in the East. Okay. So we bridge this gap. With the help of the, of the individuals, we manage to attract. So that's basically the idea, and this allows us to grow relatively fast. Okay, so this is a brief history. So as you can see, the company was created in 2016. It was actually started in three places at the same time, more or less. One was Poland, the other one it was the United Kingdom, and the third one was Germany. And well, the UK is still our biggest market, followed closely by Germany. Well, Poland also appears on the radar. The US is, well, 14% of our revenues at the moment, so it is not big. But this is actually a huge opportunity for us because this is a great market, okay? Great market, high rates, reputable companies, a lot of work that can be done by us. So, well, little by little, we've, built, we've managed to build the group of companies I was talking about earlier. So at the moment, we employ well, 1,500 is the second half data, okay? Now it is more to closer to 1,600 people. And well, during the time, all of the growth, all of this growth is done organically, except one acquisition we did in 2022. We acquired a company that provides complementary services. They are active in media space, okay? Video streaming, mostly for the Nordic countries. Okay, so it fulfilled our criteria for acquisition, except for this acquisition, we haven't done any. So, um, well, what we, this is a summary of what we are. And as Tom mentioned, we are listed on the Warsaw Stock Exchange, which is a bit of a backwater, to be absolutely honest with you. But it was easy to do, it was cheap, 
Plus, it gave us two opportunities, okay? One is that we want to retain talent. And I know, Tom, you'll have a que some questions about how we retain talent, okay? So we offer stock option plans for our employees. And I think it is fair to offer them an opportunity to do something with it. So a stock exchange would be required. And second thing is, us being, a, well, a company from Eastern Europe, with not much credibility, okay? We need as much credibility as we can buy. So being on a stock exchange, even if it isn't a major one, gives us this opportunity, okay? Because we are transparent. Well, we publish our quarterly filings. You can see how much money we have made. Well, it is all there for you to see. So, well, currently it is 77 million US dollars. Well, that's the 2022 data. And uh, well, the growth rate, the most recent growth rate is 47% year on year, based on the first half of 2023. Yep. Okay. And as you can see, we, are, we serve more than 150 clients, which is good, because they are not very big, but there are a lot of them, and they are active in different industries. So they are very diverse. And this is good for us as a company, because it's, say, e-commerce is not doing particularly well, then automotive may be going just fine, okay? And if not, then other industries may actually be in a good shape and in position to order services from us, okay? So this diversification is actually quite good, makes us stable and allows us to accept some more risk. If we had just, if we're active in just one industry, I think it'd be, well, it would be much more difficult for us to grow at the current rate. So we have a couple of brands, and, well, the one in the middle, the Better Software Group, well, will disappear very soon because we need to rebrand it. The one on the, well, left-hand side, it's a bit of a funny uh, abbreviation, is from German. Okay, now I will not tell you what it is, but it's not that. We work for the God himself. And the one on the right-hand side, uh, well, it's a design agency. Okay, and they are special. They are artists, they are great people, you know. So artists deserve a separate brand. But other than that, every company is called Spyros of something. I'm actually presenting this because if you want to dig a deep deeper, then please also have a look at these companies, okay? The one on the left-hand side, the GOD, is a company we own with a German company that is also called GOD, okay? But if you have any questions later on, I'll be very happy to follow up on this. And these are our offices. So as to mentioned, we started in Poland, well, of course, UK and Germany at the same time. But most of our engineers at the moment are located in Central Europe, which is Poland, well, then Romania and Croatia, all right? And then with our eye on the US, we have a sizable team in Latin America. They're actually in more places than just Argentina. In this slide, the Argentina is actually marked in blue. But it's uh, more than Argentina itself. And we have a growing team in India as well. So that we can provide 24-7, follow the sun type of service. Uh, well, OK, something that is particularly important to me personally. So when we started our company, well, our goal was not to be here with fantastic American investors. Our goal was to create a company where we actually want to work, okay? Something we can finally enjoy after our, well, corporate years, where we do not always enjoy it, but it. So we wanted to have a company we want to work at. As simple as that, okay? Well, all I have done in my life, uh, well, I started like 25 years professionally, is software development. Started as a programmer, project manager, product manager, you name it. I was a salesperson as well. So I thought, I knew what I should do to make this company an enjoyable place to work, okay? For people whom we need. And I think Wojtek and Engie knew that as well. Okay, so that's how we started, that's how we did it. And well, we keep, we stick to the same principle even today. If we don't enjoy working at our company, well, we will not do that. Why? Life's too short for that. Okay, uh, so some of the things that are especially important to me is we are fair, okay? I will not lie. If you have a question and I'm, I know you will not like the answer, I'll tell you the truth, okay? We are a company, as I think Tommy mentioned that, that is, well, owned by insiders. There are several hundred people that work at our company that co-own it, okay? And that's why we really try harder because this is ours, okay? We are not just people who somebody hired to do the job. We don't really care about quarterly results, to be honest, absolutely honest with you. What we care about is long term, okay? Where this company is going to be in 10, 5, minimum 5, at least 10 years from now. 
This is my concern, okay? Not what happens next month, because I don't know what's going to happen next month. We have no control over that, but I, pre I think I know what is going to happen in five to 10 years from now, okay? And at some point in time, we even had a principle that we would never, ever employ a person that never worked in IT before. <laughs> Applies to everybody, including receptionists, okay? Well, we had to relax that rule a bit, but still, uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, if we employ someone, this is a person that, ha that has known IT for ages, basically. Okay? This keeps us quite coherent and consistent in what we do. Uh, okay, so um, as you can see on the slides, well, we are basically in Central Europe, Argentina, Germany, also in Western Europe. This is where we are. And, uh, well, I personally believe that, well, we should, we are local people, okay? We live where we have our companies. So I first of all think we should pay taxes. That's why we don't do any tax optimization whatsoever, okay? We support the local communities. We work with local universities. Well, because uh, we need talents, right? So I think we have an obligation to replenish the resources, okay? We need to work with them to provide us with a constant stream of talented people, okay? Right? So I think this is equally important. It's not just profit, it's also where I live and what I do, because I meet these people in the street, okay? And they look at me. So that's why we try to support women in IT, young talents, we accept diversity, and that's why this company is not 200% about profit, it's 100% about profit and 100% about other values as well. Okay, so some industries we work for, and as you can see, we are quite diverse, and again, I was told before this meeting, you're not going to like it because we should focus on one thing and not be all over the place. Sorry, but we are all over the place. So something we do particularly well is automotive. It's both car manufacturers and car parts manufacturers, okay? Unfortunately, I, can, I cannot tell you who they are because it's, we are under very strict NDAs. Well, the only client I can tell you about is Magna, which is a Canadian company. Some of the people here are Canadians, so they will probably know it. Uh, okay, then, uh, well, something that was worth mentioning is industry. It's called Industry 4.0, which is a, a German term for the Ford Industrial Revolution. Uh, well, this is an interesting part of what we do, mostly Germany, Austria, and that region, but also the US. Uh, it is about digital transformation, a transformation from selling hardware to offering services. So if you think of Germans, they're good at manufacturing hardware, right? Cars, diggers, stuff like that. Nobody wants that anymore. They want services based on that hardware. And they have absolutely zero idea how to do that, okay? These companies. Historically, they have been hardware manufacturers for centuries now. And to them, IT is a CRM system and a web page and a couple of guys in the basement who they call IT, okay? That's it. That's all they know about services. So they need us to drive this digital transformation for them. It is exciting work, it's extremely demanding, but it's also very rewarding. So I, I wanted to highlight these two. Well, also robotics, it's not a very big part of our revenues at the moment, because the business itself is, I would say, growing, but I really have high hopes for it, okay? And very importantly, especially since we have Andrew in the room, geospatial services, this is something that is currently present everywhere, if I may put it like this. There is not a single service without geospatial information services, okay? And it's a niche. You really need to understand it inside out in order to be able to do it. And I think we specialize in it. We, we have some really bright people who really understand it very well, okay? Plus, if you ask me honestly, we'll do whatever our customers want us to do, right? So if somebody, well, arms industry contacts us and asks us to do something, we'll do it as well. But these are the industries we really know a lot about and we can advise our customers on how things should be done. We can tell them, listen, don't do this, do that instead, okay? We've done this a couple of times, never worked. I think that is a better solution, okay? Right, so from the, this is, say, from the business perspective. Okay? These are the industries we work for, but these are the technologies, broadly speaking, that we are using. So it's pretty much every modern technology out there, okay? So I'll just make it easier for you and switch to another slide, okay? Uh, so thanks very much. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. And uh, our CFO and one of our co-founders, and you are also here, so can you wave at 
the guys, okay. So if you have any questions later on, they will also be very happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you, Conrad. That was that was absolutely wonderful. Um, I actually wanted to start um, my questions to you. Um, I was going to read an excerpt uh, from Brad Stone's book on Amazon. It's the Everything Store. Um, it's it goes like this: It says, Bezos and his lieutenants sketched their own virtuous cycle, which they believed powered their business. It went something like this: Lower prices led to more customer visits. More customer visits. Uh, increased the volume of sales and attracted more commission-paying third-party sellers to the site. That allowed Amazon to get more out of fixed costs like fulfillment centers and servers needed to run their website. This greater efficiency then enabled it to lower prices further, feed any part of this flywheel, they reasoned, and it should accelerate the loop. Now, I'm not trying to put pressure on you to be Amazon. There's, there's, basically, there's one of them out there. But I, but I do think every business, even like a gas station, um, can sketch this virtuous cycle, this flywheel, mm -hmm. and, and kind of what it, you know, what it looks like. It has a vision in their head, and I'd be so. I'm curious if you can kind of sketch your vision a bit for for what that flywheel looks okay. like at Spirisoft. All right. So, well, in fact, we have multiple flywheels. Okay, and the most important one that we have been using most often is uh, our work. Okay, because the way we sell our services, I think it is important to understand it. And I know it may sound silly, but it's the word of mouth, okay? Well, what we tend to do is rather expensive, okay? So if somebody has, well, millions of dollars to spend on a supplier like us, they don't really Google for a solution, they ask around. So do you know a reputable supplier who can help me with machine learning? And somebody says, yes, I know a company called Spirosoft. They've done something very good for me. I can strongly recommend them, okay? So this is how we sell our services. So the first flywheel is actually our work. And we don't really employ salespeople, per se, okay? We don't have salespeople on our payroll. I've seen a lot of service companies that try to do it, and they almost always failed, because this is not how our customers buy it. This is not to say that we don't need marketing people, because we need them. You still need to have a nice deck of slides. You need to have, well, a web page. And I think 15% of what we do is inbound marketing, actually. But when it comes to our customers, our work is our advertisement. And well, we quite often are happy to work for lower rates. And I know it sounds terrible. If we think the customer is worth it, because we know they, they will recommend us to somebody else. OK, so we lower the prices. And we just do what we do best because we know this customer has a huge potential. Uh, well, hence, if we, we always ask our investors to look at the revenues, not necessarily at the profits. Because the profits must be there. Okay? We, we have been profitable from year two. Okay? We were not profitable in the first year. But we are constantly profitable. But what counts to us at this stage is the revenue because we need more market share, as simple as that. Right? So this is the first flywheel, I would say that we are using. And it's, uh, well, the most effective one. And, uh, you know, one thing that stood out uh, during, during our research in uh, Sparisoft mm -hmm. is, um, you know, we had trouble finding a customer you lost. Um, yeah. And I think I've heard you guys say that you really haven't lost one. Um, what's, what's, what is it about your approach um, that kind of enables such a strong retention rate? Okay, so well, uh, in fairness, we lost some customers in the past, but they were rather small, uh, say startups, and we lost them to you know the startup disease, right? right. So they ran out of financing. So uh, not necessarily because uh, we did something wrong. Uh, well, what we try to do is first of all, well, we, anybody can say we put customer first, and so on and so on. But what we try to do is to, well, the first question we ask we aren't. Please keep in mind, we are a software development business, okay? These are software developers, not necessarily people who speak a lot, all right? So they prefer, well, human to computer interaction. But uh, many companies that uh, are our competitors, they don't do it, but we do it. We ask our customers, what is it good for, okay? How would you like to make money by application of this particular piece of software? Why do, why do you want it done in the first place? Maybe it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, okay? You, you say you want this done, I can do it for you, no problem, but deep inside, I don't think it makes any sense for you, okay? So this is the first rule that we apply. Always ask if, this makes, if it makes sense to do it in the first place. Maybe it doesn't. And you know, if you start asking questions like this, it very often turns out that they actually need something else. Because, well, our customers, 
please also remember they are mid-sized, well, slightly smaller, maybe slightly larger companies. They have very little experience in software development. Okay? They do not run multiple projects. They don't have project managers that have done that for ages. So what they think they need is very often not what they actually need. Okay? So this is the first test. And sometimes we can offer something that is actually cheaper, more functional, and more of a step-by-step -step approach. So as you can imagine, if this is your customer approach, then they are going to love you. Okay? It's love. It's not that they like us. They love us. Okay? Because they truly believe that we have their best interest at heart. That's why they keep working with us. All right, well, and anybody can say that, but as you mentioned, we haven't lost a major account in never. Although the company is just seven years old, so we'll probably lose some of them at some point in time. Yeah? It's, very, this, uh, it's very interesting. So, you know, in our, uh, during our due diligence uh, um, into you guys, uh, my, my Polish analyst, uh, Stalked, uh, not stalked, sorry, uh, did deep due diligence by interviewing a number of former employees. I think we, so at the time, I think we talked to 15 people, and um, actually some of them are current. Um, I, think, I think by this point, we probably talked to 25. Um, I, you know, we found one or two mundane complaints, but basically every single, nothing, not, not the value, and it was, uh, but people loved it. I mean, it was, it was just about, it was the most favorable feedback I, f I found it. Now, you mentioned a comment about, you know, leaving the corporate world, the, yeah. the traditional one, and trying to make a place that, you know, I, you know, doesn't suck to work, shall we say. Yeah. Um, and, and that seems critical to your business because that's how these guys can go and find other jobs, and, and they're the customer-facing person. So my question is, if you could give us like almost like a little bit more specifics in what it is that you do to make it the place that's going to retain the best talent, and I'm even going to tack on a second part to this. How do you create that culture, that environment where you attract and retain the good people, but you also weed out the occasional bad apple? Okay, but, uh, right. So, well, you know, if you need to talk about culture, then it may not, may not necessarily mean that the culture is good, okay? But, uh, well, uh, First of all, we really appreciate what they do. I truly and personally appreciate what these people do. Okay? So to give you an example, when we, well, we first IPO'd on an alternative market of the Wall Street Stock Exchange. Okay? We have upgraded to the main market now, but it was like an alternative market at the time. So we decided to give some of the shares for free, almost for free, uh, to the employees, because I really appreciated the fact that at some point in time in 2016, when I interviewed them at my little flat, okay, they would truly believe that we would achieve something together. Okay? Well, well, if had I been them, I don't think I would have agreed to work for me, to be absolutely honest. Okay? So, uh, well, if you treat your employees like this, with respect, okay, not like resources, actually the word, the word resource is forbidden. Okay? <laughs> they're not resources, they're humans. Okay? You treat them like humans, you can expect them to treat you back like a human being, okay? And of course, some of them will go, uh, some of them will change jobs, which is not always bad for us, because quite often when they leave, they introduce us to their new employers, because pretty much everybody needs uh, decent software development services, right? And the word of mouth is how we win our customers. So they leave, and then they introduce us to the new employers. So they come back in the capacity as our customers. Okay, that's why we tend to part with them on rather friendly terms, right? Because you never know who's going to be your customer. And of course, we have stock ownership plans for our employees, the top one, the principal ones, the ones we absolutely need. Uh, well, and we recognize the effort, okay? I think recognition is the thing. Plus, if you're in a situation like this, okay, 2033 isn't a particularly great year for businesses like us, okay? Well, there is less money to spend. Uh, well, there are some other challenges as well. So, well, there are companies that laid people off, so simply saying, okay, I haven't got anything to do for you now. I may rehire you later on, but, uh, well, guys, I don't need you. So how about we part our ways? Here is a little something. Off you go. Well, we didn't do anything of that. Okay, we keep all the employees that we think are valuable, which are well, high-performing people with reasonable salary expectations. And I know they sit on what we call the bench, and I know they don't do anything that we can actually sell. They do some internal projects. They had help with other projects, but we will not lay them off. Okay, we will keep them. That lowered our EBITDA, by the way, quite significantly. But well, since we are in it for the long term. 
well, I know I'll need these guys in a couple of months from now. And well, hiring people in Europe isn't as easy as it is in the US, okay? It is a process that takes two, three months easy. And in order to rehire these people, I'll have to pay them extra. Plus, my reputation as an employer will be ruined forever, okay? So, and our brand is not Google, okay? I don't have a huge brand. I can always attract hundreds and hundreds of people. So I think they appreciate it. Not, they are not always loyal, obviously, but, well, that's what we do in a nutshell. Well, it sounds like my spreadsheet would be a little bit sad about the lower EBITDA, but we'll get over it, so that'll be okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm absolutely sure it makes sense in the long run, okay? So, and that's what's important to me. So, so, yep. so um, here's a question. I feel like you might have an interesting mm -hmm. answer to this one. Is um, artificial intelligence applications, mm -hmm. um, like, Chat GPT, um, very hot topics in investing circles today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been trying to suss out um, where the uh, say the, the the genuine applications of it is versus just tech people needing something new to pump after a difficult 2022. Um, and uh, and I, I I know the truth is always in the middle. Um, you know, certainly there's something happening there. And my question is is you know, how do you think about positioning your business so it benefits from from these trends as a tailwind rather than hurts facing them as a headwind? Like, how do you how do you kind yeah, of yeah. get your sale in the right direction? Well, uh, we are already benefiting from AI, okay, and we have for some time. So, first of all, this is something we sell. We sell AI services, okay. Our customers come to us and, and ask us, hey. Well, can you develop a private chat GPT for me? Okay, because I would like to use all the information, all the knowledge I have inside my company, and I would like to create a chat GPT like tool which I can ask, hey, uh, about this or that. Okay, so we are doing this. So this is, uh, well, a new revenue stream, if you think of it. Second thing is, well, AI is not really revolutionizing programming as much as people think. Okay. Uh, well, something that made a huge difference okay, across all the years is uh, public cloud. Okay? That was a revolution. Well, all the programming frameworks, integrated development environments, okay? the switch from assembler to object-oriented programming. That, these were all changes that I remember, okay? and they had an enormous impact on what we do. AI makes us by our own measure, 5 to 20% more productive, which is still something, okay? And, well, which is great because the more productive we are, the higher rates we can quote. So it's good. I love AI. But, to be honest with you, well, object-oriented programming made us 10 times more productive, okay? And it somehow didn't kill the business. Well, what it did, quite importantly, is it made the service more available. So this is all what it does, okay? Public cloud frameworks, all of that makes it available to companies that are that smaller than, say, well, Google, okay? Anybody can use it now, and they can become our customers, especially that we specialize in mid-size to, well, slightly larger enterprises. So this is good. I love it, okay? <laughs> and, well, we, we have rolled it out for our customers already. So we are using it, all of these latest technologies. So, well, are you interested in the details? Are you? Well, not necessarily. Well, I tell you what, actually, we're... Because I can uh, give you a very nice example, but it's sort of technical, so if somebody's not into so IT, they may I'm looking at the clock. We've got six minutes, but we have hours at the bar later, potentially, right. so maybe we dive it deeper there, <laughs> um, and I'm looking at... But, so, I see six minutes left, so I, I was thinking I'd not just keep talking and I'd open it up to Q&A. Um, oh, sure, of course, yeah. Should we do that? Anyone? What type of, what type of applications do you work on? Is it PC applications, embedded systems, okay. all kinds of if things? If I may use one of the previous slides to answer your question, okay? So uh, this is what we do. So, uh, well, these are the technologies that we are using, okay? And so as you can see, everything is there because, uh, well, typically our customer in, well, interacts with a mobile app of some sort, okay? Uh, well, it could, be, it could even be virtual reality, but a mobile app. Then this mobile app connects to a cloud that we also use. In the cloud, we run AI-based applications that process the data, and then we get the data, well, in case of our industrial clients, from sensors that are fitted into physical devices. So think of a digger, okay? You need to fit it with, well, good 100 sensors in order to be able to know where it is, what it does, and so on. And you gather all this data, you send it to the cloud, you process it in the cloud, and you send, well, in information where the digger is to the mobile. 
okay, all to the PC. And you generate a lot of reports in the process, and you interact with SIP systems so that the customer gets an invoice, for, for example. So it's all of that. Otherwise, it is not, it doesn't add any value, okay? Otherwise, our customers would have to employ several suppliers, and they don't want to do it. It's like sort of building a house, okay? You've got the wall, you've got the paint, you've got everything, you have multiple suppliers, and all of a sudden, uh, the house collapses, and whose fault is it, okay? It's a blame game. So they don't want to play it. That's why they hire us. Yeah? I'm not sure this answers your question, does it? Sort of. So not really. OK. They are. They are PC applications as well, but uh, well, if you have a PC like, like this laptop here, okay, so we are able to do a well standalone application on this PC, but everything it has web interface now, okay. So it's a matter of uh, interface. Everything is in the cloud on a server out there, and what you see is just a uh, interface, okay, and it's usually web based. Although we can do a standalone stuff as well, but it's not as popular. Nobody wants that anymore. They want web interfaces because they are lighter, more flexible, and most importantly, when you do an update, then you do not update the PC, each and every one, and your company may have thousands of them. You update stuff in the cloud, you just do it once, and everybody can see the result of that update. Yeah? yeah. So one other question I have. Okay. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for those of you who didn't hear, hear the question, so the question is where our customers are based. So it is, I think, more than 30% is the United Kingdom. 27% uh, is uh, Germany and Austria, generally what we call DAG. Then 14% uh, is the US, 7% uh, is the Nordics, and the rest is basically anywhere else. But basically the West, that's where the money is, where the need is, okay? The East has the people, but they don't have the capital and the labor is rather cheap, so they are not under that immediate pressure to automate everything. One more question. Yeah, uh, so uh, I guess it's a two-parter, but related. Number one, how do you differentiate yourself from EPAM systems or mm -hmm. DAVA or Accenture? And secondly, who's your toughest competitor? Okay, uh, may I answer the second first, okay? So uh, I, I get that quite often, and it's, uh, to be absolutely honest with you, everybody is a competitor. Quite often when we, well, when we try to win a, an account, we meet with Endava, IPAM, Deloitte, McKinsey, and a couple of companies that employ maybe 20 people, okay? So I know this sounds stupid, but it's pretty much everybody, okay? And uh, everybody around the world, not necessarily in a particular uh, location. Yeah? So the competition is enormous. So obviously, a company our size would probably be our biggest competitors, but simply because they're our size. So they can present themselves as something similar to us. Okay? So what differentiates us from, say, EPAM and DAVA, so companies that do something similar but are much bigger? So I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of people who will tell you that in this line of business, you can have USPs like, we put customer first, or we specialize in that technology. This is not a USB, and uh, anybody can say that. So there are just two things that, we, that are different. First of all is our network of con connections, basically people who would recommend us, okay? This is our, our, in a way, this is our total addressable market, okay? This is the people that know us. That's why we are happy to lower the rates to do more work, because then you can count on more people to introduce us. And then in time, we can bring the rates to where they should be. And second thing is, we try, we'll, uh, the second is related to the first one. That's why we create uh, so many dot companies. This is why we have this picture, okay? This picture here. Because each time we create a new company, we bring to the table a new guy who's got his own network of connections and is super motivated to use them because they are shareholders of one of the doctor companies, okay? And what we want to do with this whole group of companies, okay, we want to IPO on what we call a major stock exchange, okay? So we have a goal that unifies us. It's part of our strategy. It's available on our webpage as well. You can download it. So, each, uh, so we'll do a share swap before we do the 
second IPO, <laughs> if I put it like this. And they are working very hard so that they get the biggest slice of the pie, right? So that's the only two things that separate us from our bigger or smaller competitors. We don't really have any other advantage. I could tell you that we can very effectively uh, digitally transform a company that manufactures diggers, but I'm quite, quite sure that there are hundreds of companies out there that will tell you the same thing, right? Okay. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>